continuation, really, of the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of people just think, oh, yeah, Sermon on the Mount, that was Jesus, you know, Matthew 5, a little bit of 6. It's into 7 as well. So Jesus has some profound, some powerful things to say to us here this morning. It's very timely. We've been going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. This is what Calvary chapels do um, until September 20th was the last time we did Matthew. And just uh, with the election coming up and all the things, the Lord had put some different sections of scripture on my heart. But I feel like uh, we're going back into Matthew verse by verse. So excited to do that. And before we start, I wanted to thank you um, for those of you who got a lot of um, uh, texts and you know emails and some phone calls, and uh, I know you're praying for me. I did have eye surgery on my left eye two weeks ago Thursday and uh, for torn retina, and um, it's not 100%, um, uh, some of you. Uh, it's it's kind of cool, though, because I look in the bathroom mirror, I can tell the difference. So in my left eye that I, I can start to see something from now, actually more and more every day, praise the Lord. So in my left eye, I look in the bathroom mirror, and I go, man, you look like a thin young man, you know, for your age. And then I close it and I open the right and I go, oh, my God, you know, what's this? And that's the true one, you know. So it's like maybe it'd be cool. If, no, but let's not go there. So uh, but anyway, thanks for your prayers. Not 100 percent, but praying that the Lord and knowing that um, that's what he does. Jehovah Rapha is the mighty healer. Amen. And I know there's other uh, praise reports out of there, out, of, out here as well, as far as uh, cancer and remission, and all kinds of cool things. So this morning we are in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to do verses 15 through 23. The name of this morning's message is Sheep's Clothing. Sheep's Clothing. So again, we're in Matthew 7. Let's take a look. I'll read through verses 15 and 23, and then we'll dig in. Jesus speaking, talking about you'll know them by their fruits. And he says in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Lord, this morning, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to not naturally, but supernaturally understand the deep spiritual meaning of this. And that, Lord, in these few verses today lie the most important question in this life. Are we really a Christian? Are we really sold out for you? Is there fruit, spiritual fruit, in our lives or not? Because, Lord, it's not about talking the talk. It's about walking the walk. And so speak to us. Thank you in advance for doing it. In Jesus' name we pray and all said, Amen. Amen. Once there was an emperor in the far east who was growing old <clears throat> and he knew it was coming time to choose his successor. Instead of choosing one of his assistants or even one of his own children, 
he decided to do something different. He called all the young people in the kingdom together one day and he said, it has come time for me to step down and to choose the next emperor. I have decided to choose one of you. The kids were shocked, but the emperor continued. I'm going to give each one of you a seed today, just one seed. It is a very special seed. And I want you to go home, plant the seed, water it, and come back here one year from today with what you have grown from this one seed. I will then judge the plants that you bring to me, and the one I choose will be the next emperor of this kingdom. There was one boy named Ling who was there that day, and he, like the others, received that one seed. Ling went home, and he excitedly told his mother the whole story. She helped him get a pot and some planting oil, and he planted the seed and watered it carefully. Every day he would water it and watch to see if it had grown. And after about three weeks, some of the other youths began to talk about their seeds and the plants that were beginning to grow. Ling kept going home and checking a seed, but nothing ever grew. Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks went by, and still nothing. By now, all the others were talking about their plants, but Ling didn't have a plant, and he felt like a failure. Six months went by, still nothing in Ling's pot. He just knew that he had killed his seed. Everyone else had trees and tall plants, but he had nothing. Ling didn't say anything to his friends, however. He just kept waiting for his seed to grow. A year finally went by, and all the youths of the kingdom brought their plants to the emperor for inspection. Ling told his mother that he wasn't going to take an empty pot. But his mother encouraged him to go and to take his pot and to be honest about what had happened. Ling felt sick to his stomach, but he knew his mother was right. He took his empty pot to the palace. When he arrived, he was amazed at the variety of plants grown by all the other youths. They were beautiful in all shapes and sizes. Ling put his empty pot on the floor and many of the other kids laughed at him. A few felt sorry for him and just said, hey, nice try, bro. When the emperor arrived, he surveyed the room and greeted the young people. Ling just tried to hide in the back. My, what great plants, trees and flowers you've grown, said the emperor. Today, think of it, one of you will be appointed the next emperor of this kingdom. All of a sudden, the emperor spotted Ling at the back of the room with his empty pot. He ordered his guards to bring him to the front. Ling was terrified. The emperor knows I'm a failure. Maybe he will have me killed, he thought, as they brought him to the front. When he got to the front, the emperor asked his name. My name is Ling, the boy replied. All the kids were laughing and making fun of him. The emperor asked everyone to quiet down, and he looked at Ling and then announced to the crowd, Behold, your new emperor. His name is Ling. Ling couldn't believe it. Ling couldn't even grow his seed. How could he be the new emperor? And then the emperor said, One year ago today, I gave everyone here a seed. I told you to take the seed, to plant the seed, to water the seed, to bring the seed back to me today. But I gave you all boiled seeds, which would not grow. All of you, except Ling, have brought me trees and plants and flowers. When you found that the seed would not grow, you deceived. And you substituted another seed for the one I gave you. Ling was the only one here with the courage and the honesty to bring me a pot with my seed in it. Therefore, he is the one who will be the new emperor of this kingdom.
Christian, listen, it's interesting that here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What's our Savior saying here in Scripture? Here's what he's saying. That it's not enough to just look like a Christian on the outside. You see, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, listen, he wants us to be genuine on the inside. He wants us to be the real deal. And here's the other thing. When it comes to Christ Jesus' kingdom business, he does not take kindly to deceivers. He doesn't take kindly to deceivers. Malachi, first chapter, verse 14. But cursed be the deceivers. Paul says it like this in Ephesians 5, 6, and 7. Let no one deceive you With empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And then in Ephesians 4.14, Paul says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning and the craftiness by which they lie in wait. To deceive. Listen again. God does not take kindly to deceivers. And that's why we see Jesus expressing the warning this morning. Here in Matthew 7 verse 15. Let's look at it again. Jesus says beware of false Prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. It's a warning this morning in the word of God. In Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, we were looking at this in the men's Bible study several weeks ago. The apostle Paul said the same thing to the elders of Ephesus, did he not? Here's what he said. He goes, guys, when I leave, men are going to rise up and they're going to draw disciples to themselves. And Paul put it bluntly, too. And he said, he said, he called such men ravenous wolves, just like Jesus says here in 715 Matthew, ravenous wolves, extremely hungry. Ravenous means starving. Ravenous wolves. Webster's defines a wolf as a fierce or precious predator, an animal, or the second definition, a fierce predatory person who is looking to deceive. Do you know that there's in the world only three species of wolves? There's only three species. But did you know that there's 40 subspecies of those wolves? And they all look just a little bit different. And they all have similar tendencies, but yet some are different. Some are more meat eaters. Some are more vegetarian. They all eat meat, but some prefer this. Some prefer that. Some are bigger, smaller. There's white. There's black. There's gray. There's three main veined wolves, but there's 40 subspecies. Of wolves. But they're all cunning. They're all crafty. And they're deceptive. They're deceptive. Back in high school, our colleague of 15 years, Princess, passed away. We were all heartbroken. Six or eight months later, my dad said, Well, do you want to get another dog, Keith? Because I know you love dogs. And I said, yeah, I'd like to. And he said, what do you think? What, what are you thinking about? 
And I said, well, you know, I like, I like huskies, but actually I like malamutes better, sled dogs, you know, in Miami. I don't know what I was thinking, right? Thick fur, they're used to the snow. And so we started looking. My dad said, okay, let's look. And so we were looking back then in the paper in the Miami Herald, and I remember he said, he goes, well, here's, this is interesting. He says, this is the, actually the only one I see. He says, it's, it's, it's a Malamute. He says, but it's half Malamute, half Canadian timber wolf. <laughs> this, the mother is a Malamute, and the father is a timber wolf. And I'm like, whoa. And so he said, let's go check it out. And I remember we went. Don't remember that day later in the afternoon, and um, we pulled up to this house in the front. And if you ever, maybe you know someone or you breed dogs, and you know you can hear in the backyard the it was just like chaos. But then you hear the please don't go any longer, Pastor Keith, and it just kept going on. And on and on. And I was like, okay, that must be the wolf. And I remember as we were walking to the front door, there's a wooden fence. And looking through that, there was a, just a little crack. And you could see there was puppies. And the mommy was right there feeding her pups. And, <laughs> and there a little further on, tied to a tree with a chain, is a wolf. And it's, you ever seen a wolf? It, you know, they're going like this. And they're going back and forth. They're just nervous. Big wolf. Long story made short, we bought one of the puppies, named it Nikina. And I had Nikina about eight months before she ran away. Never found her again. Hope that she ended up being okay. But she was the strangest little dog because sometimes she was that cute little puppy growing up and cuddly and stuff like that. And then sometimes it'd be like, where's Nikina? And she'd be under the couch. And all you could see is just her little nose. And sometimes there was things missing in the house. And she was very smart, very cunning, and very crafty. When we lived in Colorado Springs and served at the Calvary Chapel out there, me being a Miami boy, I was quick to, hey, what do you guys got guns for? For bears? Everybody had a gun, you know, all the in the back of the... Uh, F-150, the trucks and stuff, and even in the cars, you know, people, the guys would have rifles and stuff. Said, what, what's that for? For bears or snakes or like, like, no, it's for wolves. For wolves? Yeah, because they attack sheep. They attack horses. Sometimes they attack dogs and cats. And they're smart and they're crafty. I remember one time I saw one in Cheyenne Canyon National Park or State Park. I was up there hiking by myself. And just got out of my Jeep, and I look over, and there in the woods, you just, you just, you, there was a wolf. You know, first I thought, is that a coyote? What is that? And it was a wolf. He's just looking at you like that. And then he backed up, and it's gone. Jesus says, be careful for the people who are like ravenous, hungry wolves. They're cunning. They're deceptive. Listen, they want to pick off the sheep of God's people and deceive them and draw them into something that is not of God. And Jesus is warning us here this morning. There's a warning this morning to beware of false prophets, to beware of people, to beware of predators who will pick off the sheep. And he says, he gives us a warning this morning and he says, hey, they're not going to look like wolves when you see them. They're going to look like you. They're going to look like me. They're going to look like sheep. They're going to look like God's people. They're going to know the lingo. They know how to speak the Christianese. Oh, praise God, brother. Hallelujah. Thank you. Jesus. They'll know all of that. But he's saying they're not mine. They're not of me. You see? And he's saying, be careful, Christian, because inside. And remember that God sees the heart and man sees the outward appearance. 
He says inside they're ravenous wolves. They know the language of Christianese. They know Scripture somewhat. They know what to do and say. But yet it's highly questionable if they really know Christ. That's the thing. You see? They're on an undercover mission to bring chaos into our Christianity and into our churches. And perhaps more than ever, in the day and age that we live in now, we need to keep our spiritual eyes open. We need to keep our spiritual eyes open. They're on an undercover mission to bring chaos into Christianity, into churches. Listen, the Jim Jones tragedy, the chaos that finally became a cup of Kool-Aid, it didn't start as a cup of killer Kool-Aid. What did it start with? It started as kindness. It started as kindness. And he reached out to people that were hurting and that wanted to feel like they were important and be part of a family and be part of a community. He was kind to them. There were some strange things for sure, but he didn't see that at first. And it culminated in chaos with killer Kool-Aid and those people dying. But a wolf is slick. A wolf is deceptive. A wolf is not going to show his card, show his hand. You have to see it. You have to find it. You have to have the certain. Listen, the closer you are to Christ, the quicker you'll see a wolf in sheep's clothing. But if you just pick this up once in a while and yeah, I'm good, you know, and just I heard a Bible thing and a Christian song. So that's my devos and my books. Listen, you might get taken and shaken and ripped to shreds. Spiritually, financially, morally. By a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so you might ask, okay, 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 I get it. But, 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 but Pastor Keith, how will I know them? How will I know if it's a wolf? It's a good question. The first thing, if you're taking notes, hopefully you are, in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, we also saw this in men's Bible study lately. The Bible says, Dr. Luke says, they'll seek to draw men after themselves instead of pointing them to Jesus. Listen again, that's the first sign of a wolf. They'll seek to draw men to themselves other than to Christ Jesus. In other words, they're self-centered. They're self-centered instead of spirit-centered, instead of other-centered. The second thing, how to spot a wolf, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, says that these ravenous wolves will make merchandise of you. After they have your heart, they'll begin to go for your wallet. They'll begin to go for your pocketbook. They'll go for your bank account. They'll want to know your PayPal number, account, and your bank number. They become more concerned with fleecing you instead of feeding you. Beware of any man who consistently preaches about his own needs when i was a baby christian out of rehab many moons ago i got invited to go to a church i'll leave the pastor's name unknown i don't know what's going on with him now but he was at one time a celebrity somewhere and um, had his own church and um, the music was great Came out with that Fender Telecaster and a brass section and all these. Some of y'all have heard this story before, but I was like blown away. Like, wow, this is church. You know, I'm coming from rock and roll. I can hang with this. You know, this is awesome because I'd come from a little Pentecostal uh, church, which was great. It had some wacky stuff. It had some good stuff. No such thing as a perfect church. But I thought, wow, this is really cool because the band was just kicking. You know, wow. And then he began to preach and teach. And I was a baby Christian at best on the milk bottle. What I heard was really good. But I noticed a pattern over the three or four Sundays that I went. And it was this. Well, God has told me in the middle of a Bible study, a sermon, that he wants my wife to have a condo on the beach in Miami Beach. 
And he actually, I can't remember what, he gave the name of the development. And he says, and I know that I know that I know that God wants her to have that condo. And I'm asking you all to make that happen. And about the, the third time that I was there, he said, I know somebody's out there right now with a $10,000 check, thank you, Jesus, and it's going to go for that condo for Christ so my wife Monica can have it. Who is it? Who is it? And people started standing up. And the person that was sitting next to me went, oh, my gosh, under their breath. And I thought the same thing. What is this, an auction? And people were throwing big checks. And that was what I could see. The goal was to get his wife in a condo on the beach. And I'm not saying that everything there was evil. I'm not saying that the word of God wasn't taught. I'm not saying certainly that he hasn't you know, changed over these years and become a godly man. But I'm saying that the bullseye for those three or four services in a row that I went to, it was way askew. It wasn't about feeding the flock. It was about fleecing the flock to get a five-star condo on the beach. It's wrong. God blesses you with a place like that, no problemo. And if you have an inheritance or somebody, your spouse is working and you can afford it, praise God. He loves to bless his kingdom kids. But to beg, demand, to, to manipulate, to deceive, to come out. And then it, was, it didn't just go for the condo, it went for a car too. A nice, really nice. This is the kind of people that Jesus is saying to beware of. But remember, there's three kinds of wolves and, f wolves and 40 subspecies. So it's not like, okay, I know what to look for. Now, that's one. There's 39 others. How do they look? Well, you'll know them by their fruit. That's what Jesus is saying. here. You'll know them by their fruit. Aesop told a parable about a wolf who wanted to rip off the sheep. So he put a sheepskin over himself and cruised into the sheepfold. It just so happened that the same night, the shepherd also had a strange craving for lamb. So he went out to his flock and plunged his knife into the biggest sheep there, which of course turned out to be the big, bad wolf. Who's afraid of the big, bad wolf? Wearing sheep's clothing as believers, you and I need to be. But I can tell you this. These wandering wolves disguised as sheep will most definitely be dealt with by the good shepherd. He will deal with them. He who faithfully watches over his flock. And we just read about how he deals with it with fire in Malachi in Ephesians 5 Pastor Chuck Smith Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa Orange County California I'll never forget pastor's conference my first one as a young buck pastor he says here's what we're about at Calvary Chapel it's a fourfold ministry leading feeding watching and warning, and warning. My pastor down in Fort Lauderdale, I remember there at a Wednesday night service, 1,500 people, the church was small then, 25, 30,000 now, 1,500 people on a Wednesday night, and praise God, a bunch of um, exotic dancers started coming to the church. Some of them got saved pastor was a powerful evangelist and he started inviting friends and started inviting friends, started inviting friends. And, you know, we'd have to cover our eyes in the youth uh, warehouse across there because they're coming and it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, don't even look. Because, I mean, they didn't know. You know, they're dressing high heels and dresses up to here and they're going in there and they're getting saved left and right. And a couple months later, pastor had to address the congregation. And the first thing he said before I open your Bibles is, listen, I've noticed there's a large influx of young single men <laughs> coming into the church the last couple months. And we've had some reports of some of you harassing these precious young ladies. 
when they're going to their cars or afterwards. And he says, God knows who you are. You're a wolf. Stop it. Leave. Get out. And if you don't get out, we'll make you get out. Because you're not here to learn the Bible. You're here, a different variety of wolf, to prey on a woman. To memorize a few scriptures, make her think you're a Christian, and then take her home. Not for a Bible study. Different kinds of wolves in sheep's clothing. There was a family when the church first started, this church, back when we were meeting on 3rd Street, A1A, in a little storefront. And this family came out. I was working at Ponte Drinnen Club as a bellman. Three and a half years. My wife was a waitress there five and a half years. That's uh, You sink or swim as a Calvary Chapel pastor. They don't throw money at you. It's either of the Lord or not. You know? And so I'm thankful for that now. It's hard. But I remember this family started coming, and long story made short, um, the, the, the dad it was a father and mother and a teenage boy and sister. And the boy did worship. He was very good. The father knew scripture inside and out, but they were destitute. They were very poor looking. And they had this beater car and everything. And people in the church were over the course of two and a half, three months. Um, and I was blessed to see it, you know, inviting them over for dinner giving them clothes, putting gas in their tank, taking the car to their mechanic, you know, um, to get it worked on and stuff like that. And meanwhile, you know, this family was just so loving and so th- and I had them come up one Sunday and just like, thank you so much, and all this stuff. One day I'm at, at Ponte Vedra and in club, and the manager says, Keith, uh, uh, all you guys come over here and look at this. And it was from St. John's County Sheriff's Department. And they said, um, be on the lookout for a, a family that is part of a band of gypsies who are infiltrating churches in the beaches area and are taking advantage of church members and funds. And it, by the time that it was, I was starting to think about, a picture came up of them on the screen like a Brady Bunch picture. And I remember my stomach just getting in a knot. They're all smiling and going like this. It was like a glamour shot taken into church. And I thought, oh, my gosh. And that day, I got off work, and I drove from Ponte Vita and Club to a little storefront church. And as I'm pulling in, I'm still in my uniform, my Bellman suit. There's the car a few spaces over, and she's waving at me. <laughs> Pastor Keith. Hi, Pastor Keith. And I'm like, nah, like that, you know. And I get out, and I walk over there, and she rolls down the window, and she goes, praise God, you know, the such and such as gave us dinner last night, and they blessed us with $100 more and all this stuff. And I said, shame on you. She goes, what do you mean? I said, shame on you. And I took out of my pocket the printout, and I unraveled it, and I put it with their picture St. John's Sheriff's Department fan with the description. And her countenance changed quick. It went from to... And she goes, how dare you? I said, how dare I? How dare you do this? I was mad. How dare you do this to God's people, to us and all that? You know what we can... And she says something to her husband. He puts it in reverse. They back up and they take off. And that was it. Another kind of wolf. They come as a family, an individual, anybody. Not just a pastor, not just a prophet. One of 40 different types or more. To fleece the flock, to work the body, to bring in distorted doctrine. Winds of change that are not biblical. We had to deal with that a couple years ago with a young man who I think is doing better who loves the Lord, did, hope he does. I've seen him once or twice recently, but got into a movement that's a very exclusive movement that these are the frozen, chosen, and nobody else. Dangerous, dangerous. 
no longer comes here. I hope that he can come back at some point. We'll see. See where he's at. Jesus goes on in 16. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs or from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, there it is again, by their fruits, you will know them. Now listen, this is not about judging people. Because in the first verse of this chapter, Jesus says what? Don't judge. <laughs> he says don't judge. But we are called as Christians to be fruit inspectors. Fruit inspe inspectors. What do you mean? I mean, Galatians 5, kind of fruit. Is there love? Is there joy? Is there peace, long-suffering, kindness? Is there goodness? Is there faithfulness? Is there gentleness? Is there self-control? Do we see any of that fruit? All of that fruit? Some of that fruit? Or none of that fruit? Is it there? That's how you can tell. The fruit we are to look for is not flawless. Listen, because every person except Jesus Christ has flaws and shortcomings. But what Jesus is saying in Scripture here is that the issue is not finding flawlessness. The issue is finding fruitfulness. You see? Finding fruitfulness. And some of that fruit sometimes will have bumps and bruises and stuff on it. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be flawless. I remember one time I was invited to a um, party at Youth for Christ. We were, Rich Mullins was the guest that was coming in, and it was my job to get him you know, ready and everything, and I was starving. I hadn't eaten that day because I was also cutting grass on the side to, so I could raise support for Youth for Christ. I was busy, 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 you know, trying to make ends meet, and I was starving, and I came in, and I'd taken a shower, you know, and gotten dressed up for this thing, and I get, flew over there, to the place where he was, we were doing the fundraiser dinner and then the concert, and um, and I saw this. They had this this fruit thing, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think anybody will care or notice if I take that big juicy red apple. And I took it and I went like that. And as I bit into it, I thought, my teeth are gonna break because it was plastic. <laughs> wasn't real. It was fake, but it looked real. But it wasn't. The enemy wants to break us. Not just our teeth, our spirit and our soul. And he wants people to, I, that's why I don't go to church, because there's just such freaky stuff that's going on, you know, and there's false prophets and people trying to get my wallet and my heart, and then there's just weird stuff that they do. Listen, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.10, he says, approve the things that are excellent in each other. We're supposed to be encouraging each other. Approve things. Approve things. Uh, I'm involved in a um, startup chamber of commerce at the beaches, and there's a thread going on, Facebook Messenger, and um, everybody's Christian on there, and, 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 and there's just there's encouragement coming in. You can see these different gifts that some of these business owners have, and there's, there's scripture, and you know, praise God for that, and I'm praying for you, and I'm doing this. It's approving the things that are excellent in each other. Are we doing that? With each other, it's important. Because look at verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There are trees, there are Christians, there are wolves whose lives might have a lot of leaves and activities, but for them there is no real, genuine, godly fruit. These have false fruit, and they will be dealt with severely as they're thrown into the fire. What do you think that is? Thrown in the lake of fire. They're going to hell. Matthew 25, you don't have to turn there. You know the scripture. Jesus judges the nations, verses 31 through 46. What's it say? He goes, I'm going to have my sheep on my right hand side. Right hand's always the strength and righteousness of God. Nine times out of ten in the Bible. The right side. So he says, uh, on the right hand as I judge the nations, that may be coming quickly, y'all. It may be coming quicker than we ever thought. 
I'm coming to judge the nations. My sheep, my peeps, my people on the right-hand side. It's going to be true fruit. They're going to have real fruit. They're going to be sincere. But on the left side of me, there's no fence, by the way. It's either right or left. And on the left side, he says, are the goats. False fruit. Deceptiveness. But Lord, didn't we, didn't I feed you? Didn't I water you? Didn't I come and clothe you? Didn't I do? I came to you in prison. I helped you when you were sick. Or you just says, be gone. I don't know you, servant of iniquity. Be gone. Into the fire. You're a fake. You're a fraud. You're a wolf in sheep's clothing. Just because you talk the talk doesn't mean squat. Are you a sheep? Hopefully. Everybody in here, hopefully is a sheep. Or are you goats? Are you goats? Verse 21. Starting to wrap. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The will of the Father, number one, is that we believe in Jesus Christ. Christ. That's the first thing. And the second is that we love one another, that we encourage each other, that we edify each other, that we approve of those things that are good. Hey, man, I saw that in you. I love that. You know, not judging, but also spiritual fruit inspectors. Lord, give me the, is this guy, is this gal the real deal, or is there something that's askew spiritually speaking? Is it a potential train wreck? Waiting to hand accountability. So necessary. But Jesus should be the Lord of our lives in deed as well as in word. James 1.22. What does it say? But be what? Doers. Another way we can be inspired. Is this person doing the word? Living the word? Or just hearing it and deceiving themselves? Many will say to me in that day, it's just like Matthew 25, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? You see, many of these ravenous wolves and these false wolf, uh, fruit trees are going to come to Jesus and say, Lord, didn't we prophesy and cast out demons in you? Miracles? And listen, Christian, the question arises, how could these wolves, these false leaders, these false fruit trees do these things? How could they prophesy? How could they cast out demons? How could they do miracles if they were fakes? If they were frauds? Number one, they were lying. They never did them. Have you seen that? It's important. And I have some good friends that are more Pentecostal than me. Some are blessed. That's all good. And I know, and I believe you and I, that it's, you know, not personal experience, but I actually have Also seen the altar calls up front, some places that I've done praise and worship at, and they call on. It's just like one of those guys standing behind him. You can hear the one each room catch the wind and blow a little. And their plants and their people and their catching and their deceiving and trying to make it look like it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not. What is it? They've got bad breath. I don't know what it is, but they just fall back. And you can hear the talking. I heard the talking.
Balaam wasn't right with him? Absolutely. Did the Lord not prophesy through Saul, even though Saul's heart was far from him? Absolutely. Did thousands of people get saved through my pastor that was down there who later fell? spiritual eyes to see things that are not of you. Deceptions and lies. Deceivers. Angels of light that declare one thing and do another. Thank you, Lord, that you tell us we're not to judge, but we are called to be fruit inspectors. So, Lord, as we look at a new year, new change, Give us your wisdom, your discernment. To know what is of you, what is not of you. Sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's very hidden. Turn on your light now. Expose the darkness. And if there's anything in us that's displeasing to you, maybe as you say in Corinthians, it calls us to examine us. Thank you. 
bless you. Let's all look to our good shepherd and trust God in his name. Amen. If you need prayer for any reason in this season, please come up front. We'd be more than glad to pray with you. If you'd like to go have a cup of coffee or a snack and fellowship in the cafe, we'll see you there in just a bit. God bless you.